Let's now pick up our discussion of economic growth and productivity in the 17.2 section of lectures. So the first thing we want to take a look at is some of the historical record from roughly 1970 to 2020 for this particular issue. We want to talk about economic growth and we've already gone through some numbers when we did that uh, rule of 72 to illustrate that if your growth rate could move up from 2% to 3.5%, from 3.5% up to 7%, any increase in the growth rate will rapidly increase the, uh, rather rapidly decrease the number of years it takes to double the size of the economy. So that's why it's important. You see in this graph, all of the um, blue lines, the vertical blue lines are all positive growth rates and the orange um, lines are negative growth rates, meaning those were years of recessions. So you see, um, since the 1970s, there's been uh, not a trivial number of recessions, but thank goodness there's been more, more growth years than recession years. So uh, a couple things to mention. Uh, the U.S. growth has only hit 7% one time, as you can see right here in President Reagan's um, first term in office, a very famous economic boom. Uh, but it, you know, like I said, it took place for one year. Uh, that's incredibly high growth rates for the U.S. Also, we've had a couple of 6% growth rates, but generally speaking, the growth rate is um, down um, is anywhere between two and 4% seems to be our long-term average. Uh, small changes in the growth rate can have a huge compounding effect over time. I'm sure you all have done compound interest before, so you know what I'm talking about that if you have a 3% growth rate this year so that the economy grows from 100 to 103, next year when you have another 3% growth rate, it's not just an increase of three, it's 3% of not 100, but of 103. So growth grows on top of growth, which accelerates the growth, which is why we recognize when your growth rate can be accelerated um, up to, for instance, 3.5%, uh, you can double an economy in only 20 years. Because normally three and a half percent per year, you would think, oh my goodness, three and a half divides into a hundred percent. You know that takes almost 30 years to do that. But how do we double in only 20 years? Because the growth is compounding on top of growth. So the higher your growth rate, the faster you can double your economy. And using that rule of 72 again, I just tossed up a couple of extra examples. Um, if we if our growth rate is low, like one percent every 72 years. So we're talking about um, to double, you need to go through three or four generations in order to get to that doubling. That's a lot of time. So you would not experience the economy is growing very rapidly at 1%. You would not be able to feel it. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between you know, zero and 1%. It's very difficult to feel 1%. But once you start getting above 1%, let's say 2% or 4%, uh, especially 4%, but even 2%, doubling every 36 years. So that would be during one person's adult lifetime, from the time they started in their 20s till they're, what, 56, almost 60 years old. So you could remember what things were like when you were a kid to what they are now. You could see the economic growth happening at 2%. At 4%, it would be downright dramatic. Every 18 years, that would be from, what, one parent's generation to their kid's generation, it would double from the time you know you went from getting married to the time you had your uh, you know your, your first kid um, reaches uh, college age, the economy would have doubled. That's absolutely amazing. And then six percent growth is just so fantastic. If you could do that each and every year, every 12 years, that would mean during a normal person's adult lifetime of say 40 some 30 let's say 36 years, the one we did earlier. In 36 years, it would have doubled three times. So that would be what doubling and then doubling again is a four time increase and doubling again would be an eight time increase during one adult person's lifetime. So uh, growth is important. That's like, like the whole point of going through these numbers is to remind us why growth is so important. Now let's go ahead and um, use our GDP numbers to measure a few things. We're going to try to measure living standards. Now, living standards are directly tied to how much income you have. The more income you have, the bigger and nicer house you have, the bigger and nicer and more cars you have, the more vacations you get to go on, the um, better health care you can afford. You know, all the things that the material factors of life that make life better can be purchased at higher incomes rather than lower incomes. Now, of course, it doesn't measure your spiritual values and we're not making any claims that countries that are richer have a better spiritual condition, 
but clearly we're talking here in material terms only. So let's take a look at how we measure these things. As you can see highlighted in blue, we have something called GDP per capita. So you take the total GDP and divide it by the population. And that tells you out of the total amount of, of income and production generated by your society, if you divvied it up evenly, this would be the dollar amount per person. So in the US in 2020, we had a $21 trillion economy. We had 330 million people. You do the math, it works out to $63,636 per person. Now, of course, that's not what literally every person gets because um, some people are super highly productive, like you're an entrepreneur like Elon Musk and you invent an entire industry and then you do it twice. You did what uh, PayPal and completely revolutionized uh, payments and then turned around and invented a car company and now he's doing Starlink. And I mean, it's pretty amazing. His income is measured in hundreds of millions of dollars per year and his total wealth is in billions of dollars. Whereas mine, of course, uh, my productivity, well, I like to think I'm a productive person. I'm nowhere near as productive as Elon Musk. So the totals would be different for me than they would be for Elon. But if you averaged it, it would be $63,000 per person. Well, where does that stack up in the world? Well, as you can see, Germany is right at 47,000. So a little bit behind the US, but not dramatically so. Um, Russia, another world power, is dramatically lower. Russia is at $10,230 per person, and China is right neck and neck with them at $9,460 per person. Lots of people don't realize this. The reason why Russia and China are world powers is obviously with a large enough population, even with small dollar earnings per person, if you tax those people uh, in total, even though each individual person can only kick in $1,000 worth of taxes, you do it for enough people, you can, have a, so you can pay for a pretty large military. So as long as your country is physically large in numbers of people, even if it's poor per person, you can still pay for a lot of military. So that's why Russia and China are world powers militarily. Cuba is even farther behind than Russia. Cuba is a very poor country, uh, especially compared to the US, but compared to India, they're not. And India is over at, um, down at $2,000 per person. India is a very interesting example. India has been breaking out of a long-term um, status as a, a less developed country, and since the 1990s has been developing rapidly. But it also has a huge population, and a big chunk of that population is rural. So in the cities, many people in India are doing very well, especially people in IT or in uh, drug manufacturing, there's several um, uh, very well established and respected industries in India where people make significantly higher incomes than this. But when you blend them in with literally millions of people still living on a small subsistence farm, plowing their fields with a buffalo rather than a tractor, the total productivity of India only works out to $2,000 per person. So India has a long way to go. But it's doable because China was at the same level of India as recently as the 1980s. But China had a growth rate close to 10% for over a decade. Now remember, when we do that rule of 70s, if you can do 10% a year, you're talking about doubling every seven years. So within a 30 year period, China goes from $2,000 a year, doubles to 4,000, doubles again to 8,000, and now is up to 9,000 something. So if China can maintain its growth path, it will way surpass Russia relatively quickly in its total GDP. Hopefully we can do the, not we, hopefully India can do the same thing for India, that they're able to get untracked and have a major increase in productivity, especially for its rural populations. Now, the next measure of productivity, we are gonna measure, um, we're gonna take the real GDP and then instead of dividing it by the population, we're gonna divide it by the labor force. And this gives us GDP per worker instead of GDP per capita. The GDP per capita tells you how much the average person can share on average in your society. The GDP per capita says, okay, now let's divide by workers. So we find out how productive is the average worker. And so uh, obviously the larger that number, then the, the ability to produce GDP for society increases. Now, many people criticize this particular number and prefer the next measure, real GDP divided by labor hours, and that's called output per labor hour. Herein lies an interesting problem. Um, let's compare Germany with the United States. 
Most people are quite surprised at Germany's low GDP per capita. They say, well, wait a minute, Germany? I mean, aren't they like the best engineers in the world? They produce Mercedes and BMWs and all that kind of stuff. Why is their level of income so much lower? Well, part of the problem is, is not everybody in Germany works. Large numbers of people, because they have a lower retirement age, uh, Germans don't work as many hours. As you all know, Europeans um, work fewer hours than Americans, for instance. Uh, part of their culture of trying to deliberately, what, slow things down and enjoy life more. That's a choice you can make, obviously. But what impact does it ultimately have, even if you're a highly productive Mercedes worker, but you are um, only working 35 hours a week and an American auto worker is working 40 hours a week, then clearly the American worker is going to have a higher income. I mean, because income is defined by the amount of stuff you produce. So many European countries deliberately choose to have lower levels of productivity. Now, they don't always choose to have the lowest lo level of productivity. Everyone wants the time off and the high income at the same time. But you all realize that that is just simply wishful thinking, right? High income comes from being highly productive. And one of those ways of being productive is, of course, working lots of hours. So you can't have it both ways. I mean, if you want to have lots of money, you got to work a lot of hours. It's pretty much um, not the only way, but it certainly is something that would be um, very, very conducive to having a higher income. So it turns out that Germany's output per labor hour is quite high. It's pretty much equal to the United States. But since they work fewer hours, then their total GDP per capita is lower. So I just want you all to recognize why these numbers can differ. Now, let's take a look here. For This is data for the United States since the 1970s. This is keeping track of what's called the employment rate. The employment rate is the percentage of your um, population that's working. So um, as you can see over here on the left-hand graph, it starts off in 1975 at around 56%. It rises all the way to 64% by the year 2000, but then starts to come back down and you know, seems to have stabilized in the upper 50% range. Why does this change? Well, it changes for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them right off the bat, you could probably figure out what's been happening to um, the workforce participation of women. If you go back to my parents' generation, my mom never worked well, after she got married to my dad and she had a kid, had me, that was it. My mom left the labor force and became a full-time homemaker. That's a very common thing to, for people to have done in a previous generation. So the total number of women working in society well, it might only be 20 or 30 percent of women, uh, like when they're really young before they get married or you know, when they're older and the kids have finally gone away to school, then they might re-enter the labor force. But what about today? Well, even in our own class, uh, you know, obviously we, we all can't see each other here on the, on the screen, but when you're in your face-to-face -face class, how many women do you see in the MBA programs? Well, tons of them, right? So women's labor force participation rate for cultural reasons and a bunch of other reasons has shifted upward quite dramatically. So the more employment rate or the higher your employment rate, you would expect to have a higher GDP per capita, wouldn't you? Because instead of people being at home, they're over at a job somewhere and workers working at jobs are generally more productive than workers at home. Not that workers at home aren't doing anything. Obviously, if you're taking care of a home and taking care of children, you're busy all the time but it's not work that's very easily automated into making it more productive. Whereas work at a factory or some kind of uh, you know, business institution where they can apply capital to it, you tend to get a much higher rate of productivity growth. And let's take a look here on this particular slide. We're seeing how productivity can change. You notice in the first half of the graph on this dotted line, the dot, well, let's look at the green line first. The green line is measuring the actual output um, per hour in the economy. And you notice it's bobbling around here in a couple of years in the 70s, it actually declines. And then um, by um, early 19, uh, by 1981, 82, rather 1982, you can start to see it rising quite dramatically. This dotted line right here is the average of those growth rates, of all the different individual growth rates. So looking at the graph, you can see that the growth rate in the United States from 1973 to 1995, roughly, what, 22 years, we had a 1.4% annual growth rate in labor force productivity. That's a pretty low rate because that will translate into a low GDP per capita 
growth rate, won't it? And we already, already saw that at a low rate like 1.4%, it'll take a long time for the economy to double. But starting in the 1990s, in 1995 to 2008, you can see in this green line how it moved up. And then, of course, the dotted line is the best estimate of what that is. The growth rate almost doubles to 2.6%. That's a very, very in, uh, important increase in productivity, which means that workers are now producing more per hour and therefore their total income rises and the total income of the entire society rises. So let's take a look at our sources of growth. The growth rate of the total output or the total GDP can be, is the combination of two different growth rates. The growth rate of the labor force, in other words, if you're having lots of kids and those kids all grow up, I think it should be pretty obvious that if everyone has a family of five kids, there's going to be a lot of children entering the labor force in 20 years. If you have a whole bunch of families of only two kids, there'll be far less workers entering the labor force. So the higher your growth rate of your labor force, the higher rate of total output that's going to be in the economy. And then, of course, the productivity of those workers. If you have workers, for instance, uh, think of farmers. You have one group of farmers who are using a buffalo or a horse to plow and a different group of farmers are using John Deere tractors to plow. Is it obvious to everybody that the farmer with the John Deere tractor is going to be a lot more productive? Not because he is personally working harder than the farmer using a horse or a buffalo to plow. They, you know, obviously, modern farmers don't work anywhere near as hard as farmers did in previous generations, but they certainly work more productive. They, they work more productively. They get more output of wheat or corn or whatever it is they're growing can be done from a modern farmer using modern technology. And that's just in farming. You apply that across the, you know, the board for all the different productions that we do. As we keep adding more technology to it, we get a growth rate of productivity. You put these two things together and you have the growth rate of the entire economy. So where do we get those increased productivities? Well, here's our list. We have higher skills in the workforce. We have more capital, and I gave you an example of switching from horses to John Deere tractors. That would be an example of more capital. Technological advancements, so the same type of capital gets better and better and better over time, such as you look at a computer from 30 years ago, a personal computer from 30 years ago, compared to a personal computer today. There is no comparison whatsoever how much better computers have gotten and how much more powerful they are, and so that would be an example of technological advancement. And then last but not least, improved management. If you have a society in which management is not particularly good, then it's very easy to waste resources, right? Because managers aren't doing a good job. As you have better management, of course, the same workforce with the same skills, if put together in a better team, so to speak, and the team is more productive, then total productivity rises. Let's concentrate on human capital for just a minute. We've used that term before. Remember, human capital is the skill that people have. And we get that skill from either schooling or on the job training. Um, th those experience, those are the main ways that we get our um, more schooling. So it's pretty obvious that if we have more physical capital, like more tractors rather than horses to plow, we would have an increase in what's called the capital to labor ratio. And that's a good thing. The more capital you have, the more physical equipment, the better off you'll be. But here we're talking about human capital and human capital uh, you need that in order to handle the more high-tech equipment. Um, I think everyone recognizes that a worker who, let's say um, a cashier working at a store using a manual adding machine like they used to use back you know, 50 years ago um, to keep track of, of adding up the inventory compared to what a clerk today using a computer, how much more they can pull up not only what the sales numbers were, but you know, which particular items are doing better. And maybe we need to put one thing on sale rather than another thing on sale. You can do that now because workers know how to use the computer and get way more information that management can now use that previously they could. So it wasn't that management was lazy in the old days. They just didn't have access to the knowledge that we have today that computers can add to the system. AI probably will add a significant increase in the ability to produce goods and services as it helps management do a much, much better job. So the point we want to make on this particular slide is that both human capital and physical capital increase productivity, and we want to make sure that we are increasing both of those. And then last but not least, let's talk about technological growth. 
um, technological growth refers to not only more of the same physical equipment, but improving the physical equipment by increasing its technological capacity. The computer was the best example I started off with. I remember when I was when I was in college, the, uh, actually as an undergrad, I didn't even have a computer. Um, I went to school in the 1970s. Uh, when I went to graduate school in the 1980s, I got my first, um, not laptop, but a desktop computer. And I got the largest hard drive you could buy, 20 meg hard drive. Do you realize how small that is? Most programs cannot even load on a 20 meg hard drive. That was the, my entire hard drive for everything. All the programs, all the stored data, everything. That's, that's the most you could get on a computer in, that, in those days. So I just want you to recognize how much technology has changed in just um, one person's lifetime. So as technology increases, the ability to take the same worker with, the, with more training, of course, but with the same number of hours of work, a modern worker accomplishes more today than that same worker working equally hard did 30 years ago using a much older generation computer. The new worker does more work. Okay, so that's the idea of impact of technology on growth. And how do we do that? Scientific research, product development, all that stuff in innovation that you know, um, engineers constantly inventing new things. Uh, Elon Musk inventing the um, electric car. Elon Musk inventing PayPal. Those things, when they get put into society, increase everyone around them, increases their productivity. Okay, So anything that can foster new entrepreneurship and improve the continuing quality of management will increase the quality of, or rather increase the growth of our technology.